recyclers throughout Illinois. Oh, thank you, Gloria. We're here to encourage everybody um, that to please, uh, is this still working? Did, did my slide show, change? It changed it. It, it, it shrunk a little bit and we were yeah. showing all your slides on the, here comes Pete. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. It did this last time when we were doing it and then it, I might have to get out of it again. Something new with uh, new updates, I guess. So let's see. I'm still sharing, right? You're still sharing, yes. Well, I apologize that everybody gets to see all my craziness. <laughs> uh, all right. There we go. All right. So with, as I was saying, we're here today to actually try to encourage all the electronics recyclers across Illinois to find ways that they can work with their counties and municipalities in order to provide a higher level of residential electronic recycling throughout the state. Uh, we would not be able to be here if it were not for a wonderful board that I work with uh, and the incredible assistance of Gloria McDonald, our administrator. Um, so not all the board can be with us, uh, but um, many of them are trying to join, I can tell you. And we do ask just for housekeeping to please mute yourself. Um, you may introduce yourself in the chat, you know, in these days of COVID. Uh, if you uh, would like to let anybody know what your interests are, um, what brought you here today, uh, questions that you have as we're going along, please feel free to put those in the chat. Uh, we want to see those, and if any of our speakers can actually answer those questions while we're going, um, they will um, or may, but at the very end, we'll definitely get back to them and so everybody gets to see them uh, and they're not missed. And as you noticed, Gloria is recording this presentation, so it will be available uh, on our YouTube channel after uh, today. With no further ado, I would like to introduce Pete Adrian. Um, Elksma has graciously offered to co-host this event with us. And uh, did you want to introduce a little bit about Elksma to everyone, Pete? Sure. Hi, Mara. Thank you, everyone. Um, <clears throat> so yes, Elksma, the Illinois County Solid Waste Management Association. Uh, that's a mouthful. Um, we represent all the counties in Lake County, or Illinois, I'm sorry. There's 102 of them. Um, so it's a, it's a big group. Um, not everybody is actively participating and, uh, we'd certainly like to see more of that. Um, and, uh, through the work of, uh, the, the electronics, uh, act, uh, CIRA, um, we have seen, you know, more counties get engaged, which is a good thing. Um, but just to let you know, Carrie Gales, our president from Jackson County health department, myself, vice president. Uh, Becky Tracy out of uh, Perry County is our treasurer and Sarah Mummel from Coles County is our, uh, our secretary. And then we have some regional reps, Paul Cooney um, out of Ogle County, Melissa Goats out of uh, Tazewell County and Cassidy Phoenix out of Jackson County. And Doug Tool serves as our um, at-large board member from Vermilion County. So if anybody has any questions in the regions uh, to the north, Paul Cooney is a great uh, uh, resource, uh, Melissa in the central and uh, Cassidy in the uh, north, uh, southern. Um, so uh, look forward to uh, good uh, discussion today. Um, just one point, uh, Oksuma has a conference annually and uh, this year it'll be in November down in Starve Rock uh, State Park, uh, their conference facility. And we typically do have a session or two um, focused on the uh, electronics recycling in the state, get some updates from IEPA and uh, a good opportunity to have a chat with some of the uh, um, counties that are uh, operating these collections with you uh, currently or possibly in the future. So thanks, Marta. Well, thank you, Pete. Absolutely. So uh, I just a little bit about the Illinois Recycling Foundation. We're a 501c3 educational organization. We're dedicated to waste reduction reuse, recycling, and supporting markets for recycled content materials. Members come together to seek solutions to challenges impacting this mission, and we express our concerns to state agencies and political leadership when it's necessary. We welcome members of industry, government, educational institution, and nonprofits that share our goals. And we're going to offer you a few reasons to join because, hey, like no other time of the year, this is our membership drive time. 
We have been the voice of recycling in Illinois uh, for over 40 years. All the members that attend our webinars uh, attend, uh, all of our members who attend our webinars attend free of charge. There's no fees for job postings. And I can't tell you, I, I don't know very many members that don't have job postings right now. So uh, we will put those on our social media. There's discounted attendance fees for everyone who attends our in-person events. Um, our members are listed on the website directory, which is our second most used page. The newsletter features at least one member every month. Our member activities are highlighted on our social media pages and full members are also members of the National Recycling Coalition. We keep our membership dues low, but we do encourage you to consider becoming a benefactor um, as that would greatly help us, support us in reaching all of our goals. Uh, coming up in February, we're going to have by invitation a, a Chicagoland Regional uh, meeting for government with the glass recyclers who've been running a pilot program for restaurants and taverns. Gloria, would you make sure everyone is muted? Thank you. Yeah, uh, I don't know who that is. Also working on the plastics recycling box. issues. The there is an amazing I'm store at Stephen Riley, I believe. The there is, <laughs> I'm calling someone out, sorry. There is, a, there is a plastic store opening on Michigan as part of the puppet theater that's completely made out of trashed plastics made to look like our everyday products. And it's an amazing installation. I encourage any of you that can get to the area January 20th through January 30th to go uh, visit. But in February, we're gonna get to talk to the artist who's pictured here, as well as uh, talk about plastics recycling in general and some of the issues surrounding it. And in March, uh, we're going to be putting together a presentation on our lovely friends, the batteries that are in everything from our electronic devices to uh, just everyday gadgets at home. And so we're, <clears throat> excuse me, and toys. And we're gonna talk about what can be recycled and what's not, and what's causing fires in some of our MRFs and how to handle batteries. So um, today we're lucky enough to have three sponsors of this amazing webinar. Um, this is a second in a two-part series. Um, the Electronics Recycling Representative Organization, or as we like to call it, the Clearinghouse. Um, URT, which is Universal Recycling Technology, and NW Recyclers. A little bit about each organization. The Electronics Recycling Representative Organization is a nonprofit formed in 2014 that promotes responsible electronic waste recycling, researches electronic waste recycling legislative policy options, and where appropriate, provides electronics manufacturers and electronic waste recycling programs the opportunity to operate or participate in electronic waste recycling programs under specific state laws, which is exactly what we're here to do today. So, uh, the Universal Recycling Technologies, uh, as the recycling industry's trusted leader, URT provides full service electronic waste and universal waste recycling to everyone from municipalities and governments to individual consumers. Their complete transparency gives customers the peace of mind to know their materials have been processed exactly as promised. And MW Recyclers, MW Recyclers provides compliant cost-efficient solutions to help dispose of unwanted business electronics. Services include, but are not limited to strategic e-waste disposal, complete with state-of-the-art data destruction capabilities, IT asset management, report creation, and more. MW Recyclers presents these solutions as bundled or standalone services. Luke Ficus is the founder, co-owner, and CEO of MW Recyclers. Luke has 25 years experience in the recycling and waste management industry and currently serves on the board of directors of the Illinois Recycling Foundation. Luke has been serving small, medium, and enterprise level businesses throughout his career. So the lineup for today, we have James Jennings from the Illinois EPA, followed by Jason Linnell, Susan Monty, Adam Jacobitz, myself, and Pete Adrian. And uh, we wanna thank Gloria as well as um, Becky Jane from the IEPA and Suzanne Boring, who've all helped put this project together. James Jennings has been the Waste Reduction and Compliance Section Manager for the Illinois EPA since 2016, and is responsible for managing the Illinois EPA Bureau of Land Materials Management Programs, RICRA, and Solid Waste Compliance Programs, along with state and federal reporting obligations. James is a member of the Environmental Council of the state's compliance governance team. 
the chair of the ASTS WMO Sustainable Materials Management Task Force, a board member of the Land of Lincoln Chapter of SWANA, and a governmental liaison to the Illinois Recycling Association. Prior to becoming section manager, James served as legal counsel to the Illinois EPA representing the agency <clears throat> excuse me, in a variety of land and water regulatory and enforcement matters. James has also worked for the Illinois Executive Inspector General and the Kentucky Department of Public Advocacy. James obtained his law degree from the University of Kentucky and his undergraduate degree from the University of Cincinnati. James, would you like to take it away? Yeah, thanks, Marta. Um, so as Marta said at the outset, um, last week it was really effective for um, people as you have questions, um, chime in in the chat, uh, because in many cases we're able to get a response somewhat immediately. Um, so as I'm going, if you have anything that pops up, um, feel free to uh, virtually interrupt uh, so that we can make sure that um, you all are getting the information out of this that uh, you really need. Next slide, please. Um, so many of you all were part of the process that took us from the, uh, the uh, long past history of not having a structured recycling program for electronics to where we are right now. Um, and this slide is really a visualization of how we got here. Um, prior to 2008, there wasn't a, an omnibus uh, recycling program for um, electronics that were residentially generated in the state. Um, we had our historic uh, model that was um, weight driven and then assigned individual goals to manufacturers who then in turn partnered with individual recyclers. Um, over time, there were some potential issues with that. Um, I, in fact, uh, during our rehearsal this morning, um, Adam actually touched on one of the uh, issues that was pretty common. That we, we run into some recyclers who, um, while perhaps well-intentioned, maybe didn't have the knowledge or infrastructure to be able to effectively operate in accordance with applicable state law. Um, that, among other concerns, got us to where we are now, which is a, the um, manufacturer funded program that has a narrower suite of recyclers um, that are um, assigned to individual county collections based on elections to participate in the program on an annual basis. Um, so we're in the third year of our program. Uh, so far, or fourth year, so far no years have been normal. We had the transition year between the two legislative models. Um, the first year uh, following some minor change op or operational changes that were made because of what we learned year one and two. And then uh, we've had two COVID years. And so um, as you'll see throughout the presentation, a lot of the information that we've got is um, continuing to evolve just because uh, no year has been uh, not even similar, but, but remotely comparable. And so we're hoping that uh, with the additional information we get, we're currently getting on COVID, but also the other programmatic models that we're seeing that we're going to be able to generate some stability for the program long term um, and offer a pretty consistent type of service uh, year to year. Next slide, please. Um, Many of you all already know this, but this is a, it's just a helpful reminder. Um, not every electronic device is covered by the, the existing program. Um, I mean, there's arguments um, for and against that position from a policy perspective, but the state of existing law in Illinois is that the 17 devices that are uh, noted here um, have to be covered or have to be uh, covered by the manufacturers if collected at a program collection site. Um, as I said earlier, I mean, we've departed from the, the weight goal, at least for the orientation of the statewide program. Um, and as in the past, I mean, counties have the ability to participate based on either their selection of um, semi-permanent collection sites or the uh, utilization of one-day collection events uh, that under the existing model um, are set based on individual population. Next slide, please. Um, so we have a... Uh, pretty diverse collection of stakeholders, um, certainly as the entity financing the uh, collections manufacturers and the clearinghouse that's supported by um, ERRO, um, counties and local government who were the primary focus of our audience last week, individual collectors, which can be anybody from uh, units of local government to private entities, um, the group plans, which are um, structured by the manufacturer's clearinghouse and are comprised of recyclers, um, and then you all, the actual recyclers, who were um, ultimately assigned to individual counties based on the division of the state by the manufacturers. Next slide. Um, the county's obligations are relatively straightforward on paper, but as we discussed last week, um, do have some potentially complicated nuances. 
Um, in March of each year, counties that want to participate in the following program year must notify the agency and the clearinghouse by submitting an opt-in form. Um, they're then entitled to a specific number of collection sites or events based on the population threshold set in state law. Um, once the county is opt in, the manufacturers have until July to craft their program plan for the following year. And then from there, the counties are assigned to an individual group planner or recycler. Um, again, uh, the county does not have to, but may participate as a collector. Ultimately, the county is responsible for identifying whether they either want a site or event. And then um, to the extent that the information is available at the time they opt in, the location of that site or the series of events. Next slide. Um, manufacturers have their own suite of responsibilities. Um, each individual manufacturer is required to register with the agency and submit a fee. Um, those fees are ultimately used to support the agency's administration of the program, which includes um, our review of the program plan, but then also during non-COVID times, um, site evaluations and compliance checks. Um, the clearinghouse is then responsible for submitting a program plan, at least under the existing model here. Um, independent of that, they provide funding for packaging materials that are used to collection sites. They pay transportation um, expenses. And then uh, they're ultimately responsible for funding the actual recycling of the materials that are collected through the program. Um, one uh, note that's important here, and this applies directly to collectors, is that um, that funding isn't necessarily universal. Um, collection sites are authorized to assess a fee for TVs and monitors to help offset some of their collection costs. But beyond that, the manufacturers are responsible for the uh, significant majority of the, of the recycling expenses associated with the program. Next slide, please. Um, so then to the recyclers, a lot of the responsibilities under current state law um, pretty profoundly mirror what we saw in the past. Um, there's still a registration fee and there's a form that's submitted to the agency so that we're able to uh, ensure that the information that we have is uh, current and then so that, that we can we have the uh, accurate roster of recyclers who would be potentially subject to agency compliance checks. Um, Communication this is going to be a theme that you'll see throughout that uh, recyclers are responsible for reaching out to individual counties and then helping coordinate the logistics of collection sites or events. Um, one item that we saw during the transition between the two statutory models is that a lot of the potential headaches that either that uh, you all could run into or that the collection sites could run into um, can be somewhat inoculated by um, effective communication. Um, and we understand that this is a um, pretty logistically complicated program. And uh, in many cases, the issues that we saw or that we helped step in to address um, could be easily uh, address handled through um, just an element of transparency and making sure that if there were issues that the collection sites had as much notice as possible. And likewise, that the collection sites provided you all as much um, advanced notice of any potential headaches that they saw incoming. Um, and then, the, uh, so the last point, um, under state law, uh, manufacturers or recyclers are required to accept all covered devices and handle them in accordance with um, CIRA and other relevant uh, statutory um, obligations. Um, recyclers may, based on your own individual model, um, work with collectors to take items that are outside the scope of CIRA. Um, that's something that's entirely at your discretion and it's not dictated by uh, this statutory structure. Um, so one way that we try to encourage people to look at this is that CIRA is ultimately the floor. Um, those are the mi minimum required obligations that you all have under state law. Um, you're well within your rights to go above and beyond that, just provided that in doing so, uh, you're not running counter to any other applicable state law. Next slide, please. Um, and as, as I uh, touched on a little bit, the agency has responsibilities too. We're required to review and approve the manufacturer program plan. Um, th this is an organic process and we haven't uh, encountered issues with this in recent years and we're optimistic in working with Jason's group that things will continue to go that way. Um, we, uh, like our other environmental enforcement responsibilities, we're required to oversee the effective implementation of CIRA. Um, Pre-COVID, this involved doing on-site compliance audits. Um, we paired that back based on uh, the um, limitations that we had uh, in 2020 and in the last year, but we uh, contemplate being able to resume that. 
um, hopefully once this wave of uh, coronavirus starts to dissipate. Um, and then we do a lot of coordination. We work with ERRO to ensure the smooth uh, rollout and receipt of information related to the county opt-in process. Same with manufacturer and recycler registration. And then we have a series of obligations for um, public transparency to post things on our website. Um, in general, unless the material is uh, considered um, confidential business information, uh, anything sent to us is uh, subject to public inspection. We don't push all of it onto our website, but that's just an, uh, something to keep in mind as you uh, provide your recycler registrations that um, anything submitted to the state of Illinois, absent some express statement um, uh, securing some type of privilege um, can be ma uh, made publicly available through appropriate channels, either by FOIA or um, other potential discovery mechanisms. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, one of the things that we're at, we were asked by far and away the most about going into um, each year is uh, recycling fees. Um, CIRA establishes two types of fees. That's not to say that other fees can't be assessed, but these are the only ones that are specifically referenced in state law. Um, the first are fees paid to the agency, and these are the um, annual registration fees for manufacturers and recyclers. The second are fees that may be assessed by a recycler to a uh, collection site based on a shortfall of um, weight in individual trailers. Um, a point that the agency has made um, throughout discussions on this, and the one I'd want to reiterate here, is that the operative word in the statutory text on this point is prorated. The state law authorizes a prorated fee of up to $600 for shortfalls on uh, weight. Um, and that, ha that would be a true proration. Um, now, CIRA doesn't specifically say what the schedule for proration is, or um, if there's any sort of accelerator within that spectrum of fees. Um, but what's pretty clear from the statutory text is that a short, a nominal shortfall um, this would not justify a fee of six hundred dollars. There has to be some sort of sliding scale. Um, <clears throat> this isn't an issue that has come up much in the last two years, uh, and there's any number of factors that may play into that. Um, but this is a point that uh, whenever our team does a presentation on this, we want to reiterate because um, uh, there's the nat there's a statutory assumption that legislative text is included for a purpose. And so the inclusion of the, the word prorated here is an indication that there has to be some sort of scaled adjustment to the fee if a fee is going to be assessed. Um, in addition to that, there may be fees that are um, optional for items that are not included as part of the CIRA collection program. This is a point that's not specifically uh, noted in the statute, but and the reason for that is that it's outside the subject matter of the um, provisions itself. Um, and so again, recyclers and collectors are um, able to negotiate fees um, or other sorts of models to collect materials that aren't covered by CIRA, just as you would if CIRA didn't exist. Um, again, that's something though that would need to be handled um, as, so, as part of a contractual arrangement independent of the program that the agency oversees. Um, on both of these points though, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to our team. Um, I would like to say that we've seen everything or all the questions we could potentially see on this front. And I also am not naive enough to say that the second I've said that I'll get 15 we've never seen before. Um, but this is an evolving issue. And so um, others will encounter it as we have more people participate in the program and as you have natural turnover within your respective organizations. So um, feel free to reach out and we're happy to discuss um, any questions that you've got on these points. Um, so uh, one of the questions that we kind of get from local government is the availability of recycling uh, um, services if they're not in the program. Uh, and this is a point I'm sure that Jason will touch on later as well. What we've encouraged counties to do is to reach out to the clearinghouse or reach out to individual recyclers to see what may be available. Um, I mean, counties have a lot of options in terms of what their collection opportunities can be, um, who can operate within the county, um, and then what um, services that they may have available. And so if you get a cold call from a unit of government that hasn't participated in the past, it's likely derived from that. Um, again, uh, the agency's objective here is to ensure that as much of the state is covered as possible by this collection program. Um, 
And in the instances where a county isn't able to opt in because of either administrative burden or um, administration change or other limitations, we still want to encourage those counties to find a way to build their collection foundation. And so um, our plan is to continue to encourage them to do that type of outreach if they're interested in having collections outside of CIRA. Um, and so just uh, wanted to put that on people's maps so that uh, you had a little bit of context if a county reached out to you um, independent of the statutory framework. Next slide, please. Um, as I said, we want to cover as much of the state as possible. And, uh, Suzanne Boring, who does an excellent job with the visualization of a lot of these data for our group, um, pulled these maps together to highlight how the program has evolved over time. Um, well, like I said at the outset, it's hard to draw some trend analysis from this just because of all of the externalities over which none of us had any control during at least three of these years. Um, I mean, what you do see is that the program is pretty heavily concentrated in northern Illinois, um, which there's a population nexus to that. And so there's a, an element of logic that certainly plays in. Um, nevertheless, uh, our objective is to try to have this map as uh, full as possible. Um, in recent years, between 85 and 90 percent of the state's population uh, have had a collection opportunity available within their county. Um, we'd like to get that as close to 100 percent as possible. And in recent years, we're seeing a trend toward that. Um, but our hope is that by the time that this uh, law is potentially subject to sunset in 2025, that the entire state is covered, or if it's not covered by this program, we're able to demonstrate some sort of um, independent collection opportunities that are available that wouldn't ne necessitate participating in the manufacturer program. Next slide, please. Um, and so, uh, as I said, we're looking at anywhere from 85 to 90 percent of the population having access to um, programs with roughly 60 percent of the counties. Um, the program weight collected um, is a pretty problematic metric to evaluate the success of the program just because of the um, intervening issues. Uh, I mean, you see a slight decrease in the volume of material collected between 2019 and 2020. However, for four months of that year, no collections were ongoing because of the shelter in place orders that had been, in, uh, had been established um, as part of the initial response to COVID. Um, we're still evaluating 2021 data as it comes through. And so um, it'll be really interesting to see what type of rebound you potentially see uh, with the uh, advantage of having a full year of collections available. Um, another point that we're asked about pretty frequently on this front is how this compares to the historic collection numbers under the previous statutory structure. Um, and this is a really difficult question to answer. On paper, it appears that less material is collected um, in, has been collected in recent years than in the past. Um, however, the reason that's a complicated question to answer is that the historic program allowed for a series of potential accelerators for crediting material based on the location of the collection, the, um, and the types of individuals who are working at individual recyclers, and then other statutorily enumerated factors. <clears throat> um, in addition to that, the model that was used um, lent itself to the potential of double or in some cases triple counting of weight, uh, which made it difficult to sort of weed through the material that was sent to the agency in a um, statistically significant and meaningful manner. So um, while these numbers are slightly lower than what we've seen under, under the previous program, uh, we're very confident that this is a reflection of the true weight of the materials that are being recycled. And that's not something we could have said five years ago. Um, so it's sort of a way of saying to watch this space for an evaluation of how things are going now that we've had not only a couple of years of understanding the infrastructure of the program, but also um, we have a better sense of how to respond to COVID and be able to um, participate in society uh, while still being um, safe and taking the steps necessary to avoid further transmission. Next slide, please. Um, Dar, so that, that actually wraps up the uh, prepared things I had. I'm happy to take questions now or we can always um, punt to the panel at the end. Definitely, I'm gonna encourage punting to the end, but it, Put them into the uh, chat, certainly. And then if James can answer them in there, he will. And we will get back to them when we get to the Q&A at the end. But thank you, James. Wonderful presentation. 
And I'm going to bring Jason Linnell next. Uh, and Jason is the executive director of the National Center for Electronics Recycling, where he leads activities such as research on electronics recycling data and policy, as well as management of the Electronics Recycling Coordination Clearinghouse. Under Jason's direction, the NCER manages and oversees the statewide networks of collectors and recyclers for the Oregon State Contractor Program and the Vermont State Standard Program, as well as administering the Illinois Manufacturing Clearinghouse. Jason, would you like to take it away? Yes, thanks, Marta. Uh, and thanks everyone for being on today. Um, Happy to tell you about the Illinois Manufacturer Clearinghouse Program that we manage on behalf of ERRO that you heard about before. So if you go ahead to the first slide, I'll tell you a little bit about my organization, which is NCER. Um, we are the a nonprofit, another 501c3. We're based in West Virginia. We do all those projects that were listed there in my bio, um, including the Electronic Recycling Coordination Clearinghouse, which gets all the states together who are managing these state electronics recycling law programs as well as other stakeholders who are participating in those programs to work on common tools and objectives there. Um, in addition to managing a few state programs and trying to do some research and data gathering and, and get some relevant data out there for everyone to, to use as we evaluate how electronic recycling programs are going to function in the US going forward. Uh, so the next slide. Uh, uh, just briefly to touch on this, since it was uh, gone over in the introduction, ERRO is a, another nonprofit with a manufacturer board. It was formed several years ago in response to a similar provision in uh, South Carolina law, um, but really uh, took shape to take on the manufacturer clearinghouse in Illinois in 2018. Um, they're the ones who decided to um, put out a request for proposals for the administrator of the clearinghouse, which um, uh, selected my organization and we've been managing it since then. All right, so James went over some of the actors. I'd like to go a little bit in more detail about who is um, playing a role in the manufacturer clearinghouse program under CIRA. Um, so obviously the manufacturers are there. They're the entity that have the legal obligations. They're the ones who have to decide whether or not they're going to be in the clearinghouse. Um, and as I'll get to, all manufacturers in the first four years of the program have decided to be in the clearinghouse because the bar is set pretty high to have a program that's separate from a clearinghouse. You basically have to cover all of the opt-in counties. Um, and and th through the clearinghouse rules that we established, and I'll get, talk about that a little bit later too, um, the manufacturers can decide to either take on counties individually, they can have things assigned directly to them, or they can participate through group plans. And again, here, um, the choice has been made for the manufacturers, they all have participated through several group plans. And I'll tell you a little bit about who those are. The group plans are different entities. They're, they're different types of organizations. Sometimes they're, they are recyclers. Sometimes they are um, sort of management entities that work with recyclers and contract with recyclers. But they're the ones who have the direct relationships for um, recycling with the manufacturers. And the manufacturers select their group plan each year. They can change their designation each year if they choose. And we can have new group plans come in and group plans fall out depending on the year and depending on who their manufacturer clients are that they have. Um, so for the first four years of the program, we've had between five, we're now down to five. We had as many as seven group plans operating in the state. And that means we would have uh, assignments going out to all of those and the manufacturers have uh, choices to make every year about which group plan they're going to use. Um, and these are very important, especially from a service provider perspective. The, the group plans are the entities that choose who their, who their service providers are. If they are recycling themselves, obviously they are um, using their own facilities as the recycling points, but not, not in all cases. Um, and if they are a management entity, they're choosing from a range of, of vendors that they have, maybe, maybe um, that they've used in the past in Illinois and in other states, or ones that they choose specifically for this program. Um, so those are the ones who are very important that are choosing and selecting which entities are going to be handling um, the, the obligations for the manufacturers on behalf of the group plan. Go ahead. Uh, so yeah, I went over this a little bit, but um, they work on a lot of the details. Once we give them an assignment from the clearinghouse, and I'll talk about how that decision is made, um, they go out and they figure out, they talk to the counties who opt in, they decide which collection sites will be chosen from the opt-in forms um, or go beyond that. They decide if they have to work on deviations from the standard, whether it's choosing four events instead of one site, 
or something else. Um, but they have to offer that bulk transportation, recycling and the packaging materials, other issues can be negotiated. Here's who the, the list of the actual group plans and recyclers for 2021 and 22. Um, just so you can see who's listed there and who all the recyclers are. Okay. Um, so the Manufacturer Clearinghouse, that's uh, my organization. We uh, work under ERRO and all manufacturers have to sign an agreement and choose a group plan. Excuse me, I'm having voice issues. I'm gonna go off camera for a second. I'll keep going here. Um, the clearinghouse has specified rules for the methodology for setting the manufacturer obligations, um, how to allocate sites and doing reporting plus private programs and true up for measuring the actual collections versus estimates. Next slide. Uh, what we do is set the, put, put together the program that's submitted to the state. Uh, we administer the manufacturer obligation percentages and we set the rules for the manufacturers as well as compiling that information and submitting it to the state for ultimate approval. Next slide. What we do not do, and uh, what I mentioned the group plans do, is contract with those recyclers, collectors, and other service providers. We don't decide which collection sites or events will be included in the final plan. And we don't decide which entities are ultimately involved. So there's uh, not just uh, recyclers, but there's other intermediaries who are also involved in helping the collectors and the manufacturers carry out the minimum requirements. Um, and we don't mandate which assigned groups uh, that we assign go beyond the proposed sites and events from the opt-in forms, including any of those that go beyond the minimum that's required. And that does happen in many cases. Next slide. Um, private programs. So uh, this is kind of alluded to, but this is something that we do offer uh, the manufacturers under the clearinghouse rules. They can have private programs that go beyond what's included in what's submitted in the plan to the state. And they, you can see the list of eligible sites that are included there. They include many retail sites, curbside collection programs, manufacturer sponsored programs, and programs in non opt in counties. So, um, as you saw on the maps, there's many non opt in counties, um, many in the uh, different areas of the state um, that are smaller, obviously, with 90% uh, of the population covered, uh, that's the smaller counties are not included but they can have programs and those can be submitted by the manufacturers in their group plans as private programs. And how that helps with everything, the manufacturers and groups can reduce their county assigned obligations by reporting these private programs and they continue to collect from those that had been in, in existence prior to the existence of CIRA. However, this doesn't mean that if they do private programs that, they, that somehow there's less activity going on overall. All the manufacturers the declaring house have to cover the opt-in counties, um, but the private programs can reduce their number that they ultimately receive. So, and we track the number each quarter. Uh, the, the group plans submit quarterly reports to us as the clearinghouse, and we use that to compare to the manufacturer percentages that we calculate at the beginning of the year. Next slide. Um, if you're a service provider, what here's, and if you haven't participated in the past, um, some things to expect. Um, so we use the registration form data and assign preferences to each um, opt-in county, uh, assign, assign each opt-in county to a group plan based on preferences. Those are both submitted by the county when they fill out that form and by the group plan when they tell us each year, uh, these are the existing relationships we have. These are the programs with, uh, that we would prefer to work with or the counties that we prefer to work with. Um, group plans then choose their service providers to carry out their obligations. And they do that in a number of ways through existing contracts, through um, maybe RFPs that they put out. It depends on through, through different ways that they go about selecting their service providers and figuring out which ones will help them uh, ultimately carry out these obligations. Um, then from the clearinghouse side, we get their um, private programs and their opt-in, uh, all their data submitted to us. 
And uh, we put together a final plan that's then submitted to Illinois EPA by July 1. Um, so if you haven't worked with any of the group plans in the past, um, you can contact us, contact me at the Clearinghouse. Uh, we'll make your information available to all the group plans and they will be able to contact you if you're interested in working as a service provider for one of the group plans. And that can be as a, uh, as a collector, as someone who's transporting, as someone who has a network of collection sites, which we do see pretty often, or as a recycler. Um, and if you're a recycler, there's all the requirements under the um, Illinois law that you'd have to follow, including the registration, and you'd have to meet all the requirements of the manufacturer's uh, agreements. Uh, and there are some specific ones that we have in the ERRO agreement with each manufacturer that they have to follow. Next slide. Uh, and what to expect, um, obviously the March 1st deadline. So if you work with any counties, um, encourage them and remind them to fill in that form, get it in by March 1 so that we can consider it for 2023. Um, we then have to wait for the manufacturers to register and submit their sales data um, for 2021 by April 1st to Illinois EPA and get that from the state. And that always takes a little while, um, but that, that is an essential piece. That's sort of one of the other pieces that we have to use in order to divide up the state is the manufacturer um, sales data and the obligation to calculate the obligation percentages. And that will happen in the May to June timeframe. We'll get the group plan designations from the manufacturers to figure out which group plans are going to be working in 2023. And then we, from that, we assign um, the, the counties, each county to a group plan. Um, and so if you're working for a county if, uh, or a county itself, they, they should be notified in that sort of late May, early June timeframe. And then you'll have uh, the rest of June to work out all the details for 2023, including uh, the sites that are going to be in operation and the collection events before we finally submit by July 1, the 2023, that should say clearinghouse plan. Um, and if all goes well, that'll be submitted and we'll um, work with the state to get that approved before the um, uh, coming year so that can be in effect for 2023. I think that's all I have. Thanks, Jason. Um, you'll have to wet your whistle there and be prepared for the question and answer at the end. Um, we're gonna hear from a county that's been opting in is Susan Monty, serves as a planner and recycling coordinator at the Champaign County Department of Planning and Zoning and previously worked with the Champaign County Regional Planning Commission. In her spare time, Susan volunteers as the executive director of the Champaign County Environmental Stewards. Environmental Stewards, ah, got that out. <laughs> Thanks, like Marta. Thanks. All right, so I'm gonna provide a coordinator point of view as a county recycling coordinator and how it works here in Champaign County, just to give you an idea of uh, how, how our county works and participates in this program. Next slide. So this is a, a snapshot of Champaign County. It's got the 10th largest population in Illinois, 205,865. And our options to participate in SARA were to either have one program collection site or opt for four one-day collections. And we continue to hold two large one-day collection events. And we've been doing uh, that kind of pattern of one-day collections for about 10 or 12 years, even prior to the, to the SARA program. Next slide. Uh, so there's a lot of behind the scenes work that, that needs to happen um, that we do as recycling coordinator and, and the team here at the county. So uh, we, to fund these collections because we do contract with a collector, we, we arrange for an intergovernmental agreement to share costs and we reach out to each municipality. There's 22 or so here in Champaign County and we request that they um, provide a contribution based proportionately on their population to help offset the costs. So um, that's how we fund uh, these collection events. Uh, the participants are not required or asked to pay to bring their televisions or monitors to these events. Next slide. So uh, we also have uh, worked with a host site um, consistently for the past eight years or so. It has been Parkland College, a huge parking lot. 
uh, since about 2015 or so, we've worked with a team recyclers as our collector. And uh, it, this could not happen with just me as a coordinator because I work with a team that includes uh, the collector, of course, their management staff, the, the uh, cities of Urbana, Champaign, Savoy, the Parkland College Administration and Building and Ground Supervisor, and the County Probation and Court Services staff. That's that's like our, our coordinating team. So uh, we do have, I mentioned, we, we have to do the advanced intergovernmental agreements and contracts with the co uh, collector and Parkland College. We also are very fortunate to have the city of Champaign uh, environmental sustainability coordinator uh, take the lead on online registration, which is a, an online registration system that she has mastered and um, has gotten that, uh, us to a point where our one day collection events are really streamlined and very little waiting time. Uh, so um, the online registration is the way to go. We, we can actually have 1600 to 1700 people uh, at each four hour event with, with little or no waiting. It's, it's really wonderful. So also we, we are, uh, fortunate to have community service workers who are looking for service hours. And we work with our county probation and court services staff to coordinate recruiting of those. And, and that, that, uh, that can add up to about 80 to 100 workers per event, which is fantastic. All right, next slide. So here's an overview snapshot of, of the layout of our typical one day collection. This was prepared by the collector that we have contracted with, 18. And we have double lines. We have an entry point where we check for registration evidence and that's a postcard system that is used. And uh, like I said, we have like 100 vehicles coming through um, each 15 minute increment. And it, it's a very streamlined event. There are two collection lines. I like to compare it to a, a very streamlined kind of system. And we, we do have volunteers that are set up to monitor traffic flow in and out of the site. We no longer need um, police patrol because this is such a streamlined system that there are very little uh, snafus that happen because of long waiting times. Um, prior to using online registration, we used to have people running out of fuel waiting in line. So that was like, terrible kind of crazy thing that would happen with an hour or so waiting time, but no longer is that the, the case. So let's see, um, what else did I wanna say about this? Um, no, next slide. So I mentioned some of the advanced planning on the day of the event. I mentioned this kind of thing that uh, we go through traffic control, checking in the vehicles, community service workers get checked in and out. And that usually is, done by the uh, county probation staff. Um, and those workers are teamed up to help unload the vehicles. The collector is so uh, expert at what they do is that they, they can even handle unloading this amount of vehicles with their own staff, like during the COVID pandemic when we did not have probation uh, workers. They were able to increase their staff and handle this same kind of traffic uh, and participation with their expanded staff. So we have the community service workers also working on trash and recycling detail. And then, of course, um, we have temporary on-site signage that we put up and take down. After the event, we, we like to hold debrief meetings with our team. We review how to improve each event. And um, yeah, it's each each event gets a little smoother. Next next slide, please. Here's the kind of reporting that the city of Champaign is able. To, the the one person who does online registration is able to provide us complete breakdowns of who participated, uh, from where, all 21 per municipalities. Well, not all. There's like one or two that don't sometimes, but uh, most of the municipalities participate in these events. And we, like I mentioned, we are able to register approximately 1,600 to 1,700 per four hour event. We have like an 89% participation rate. 
generally uh, show up rate uh, out of that number register. Next slide. So um, we get all kinds of uh, good information from the collector that we contract with, and we are able to monitor tons and weights received. And uh, on average, each collection event here, you can see varies from 62 tons to 164. So yeah, it's, these are large collections. Next slide. And we're able to provide uh, reports to our local officials that monitor the, the like the trends, TVs and monitors, the CRT we can see uh, have peaked in 2019 and are coming down and now we're getting more flat screen as you would expect. So these kind of reports are provided to our local officials. So next slide. So yeah, that's that's an overview of how it how we do our one day collections here in Champaign County. And um, I'm available to answer any questions if you should have any. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Now that was wonderful. It was very insightful, I think, for anybody who's not familiar with how to do these things. And I don't know if you caught it, but she's doing the 16 to 1700 cars in four hours. So obviously that's some labor intense work. So <laughs> um, next we're gonna do Adam, who's gonna represent this as a collector from the private sector side of the world. Adam Jaquitz is the vice president of Eagle Enterprises Recycling Incorporated and has worked in the recycling industry since the age of 10 when his parents started the company. He's done every job possible in the collection of recycling and garbage from manual sorting in the MRF, running forklifts, skid loaders, bailers, doing curbside collection on the back of a truck, driving collection routes and roll off trucks, conducting waste audits, helping businesses create recycling programs, writing and coordinating municipal collection programs, trying to innovate new ways to provide more service Adams served on the board of directors for the Illinois Recycling Association as represented them on the committee working to write and pass CIRA. He coordinates Eagle Enterprises Electronics Collection Program, which has provided an electronics drop off for over 16 years and incorporated curbside electronics collection and certain municipal programs for over 10 years. He manages the CIRA program for Henry County and Stark counties. Well, thank you, Marta. Uh, glad to be here. Um, so I'm Adam Jaquit from Eagle Enterprises. Uh, we're a little different uh, kind of operation. We are a private business that provides electronics recycling services for uh, two counties through uh, the Sarah program. Uh, we're talking about our program, our history, where we've been, and how we got here, and how to move forward. So next slide, please. So, uh, like I said, uh, we've been doing this over 16 years. Uh, we started collecting in 2005 or 2006, originally working with the Tri-County Regional Collection Facility out of Macomb, Illinois. Uh, as a program run by Chad Brotz, who is the uh, solid waste coordinator for uh, three counties down there. When that program ran out of grant funding, they asked uh, the county that we are based in, which is Henry County, to support. And uh, Henry County funded that program for one year, which kept us involved. And then the next year when the, we came back and asked for funding again, they said no, uh, which meant we were out of the program uh, with Tri-County. So we went out and started uh, looking around and trying to find a recycler to work with directly to provide service. Uh, and this is around 2009 or so. And we uh, started contracting directly with the recyclers to send material to them. Uh, and then as, uh, as long as uh, recyclers had weight under the old uh, EPRRA program, uh, we were able to send stuff in. The problem we ran into is everybody saw, uh, especially back in the, before Sarah was passed, was when we ran out of weight, there's nowhere to go with material unless you want to pay to get it out the door. Well, with no funding for the program, we were operating without any, uh, any funds to support that. So we would have to just uh, stockpile material. And I think the longest we went was about five months with material, which then throws things off in the next year because now we've got five months of the previous year sitting here ready to go. Um, so when, when Sarah came in, that was a big deal uh, to know that that material was gonna have a place to go. Uh, we also started uh, a curbside electronics collection program with the village of Cambridge in 2013. Uh, this is a community that had a really high participation rate with their curbside recycling program. They had run a couple of uh, parking lot type events for electronics that had been 
for lack of a better way to put it, disasters. They had worked with a non-reputable recycler um, and they just they told people to just bring their stuff up to a parking lot and drop it off and this recycler would come through and pick it up. And that happened, but then the material just kept coming and kept coming after that. It, they established this baseline of, well, we can put it here in the city, we'll take care of it. And it turned into a fiasco. Um, so uh, after they uh, had problems with that recycler, they came to us and said, you know, can we do anything? And we said, well, let's, uh, let's work on a build different kind of a program. Um, and I can't take credit for actually coming up with this idea. Uh, it was actually uh, Vintage Tech was doing a problem, I think, in Will County, uh, back around this time, uh, picking up electronics uh, at residential locations. And we took and incorporated that into our curbside recycling contract uh, as a part of that program. But we offer uh, drop-off electronics recycling so people can bring their electronics to us and drop them off. We have the curbside programs and we also offer electronics uh, drop-off services for businesses. Um, and for a fee for businesses, we will go to their location and pick stuff up. Uh, but the, you know, it all, all that costs money. Um, and we have also done some custom pickups for residential locations who have big old stuff that they have no way to haul. Uh, again, it costs money. We're providing service, but you know, we have to make, you know, we have to cover our cost of operation uh, and people are, are willing to pay for services sometimes like that. So next slide, please. So in 2016, uh, Sarah comes our new path forward and we have this guaranteed outlet for everything collected uh, under the program. We know that we're gonna be able to get material out because there's no limits on what we have, which is great for us, the way we operated. Uh, the big hurdle for us was that uh, the county has to be opted in to get into the Sura uh, program. At that time, we had five curbside electronics collections in two different counties, uh, plus our drop-off that was collecting uh, anywhere from 150 to 225,000 pounds of electronics a year. So our options were either get the counties opted in, quit collecting all electronics, or pay to get electronics out and raise the price. Uh, residents uh, pay for electronics recycling through their curbside recycling program, which covers the cost for us to go to the house and pick it up, not the actual cost for cycling. So, next slide, please. So we went to the two counties we worked with primarily where we had the, the curbside programs. The first one's Henry County, which is where we are based. We are down in the far southeast corner of the county. We're about one mile from Knox County and four miles from Stark County. Um, we operate a drop-off that is open a lot. We're, uh, it's like 56 hours a week that we're open. So basically, whenever our office is open, we'll allow people to bring electronics in. So it provides a lot of opportunity uh, for people to come in. Um, the one permanent location that we operate then provide, fulfills that um, minimum requirement under SARA for the permanent location within the county. At that time, we also had two municipalities with curbside collection programs, which we uh, were able to classify as collection events. We worked with our county solid waste coordinator, uh, the building and zoning committee and the county board to get the initial approval. So um, we went to the county uh, solid waste coordinator and said, this is what we wanna do. We wanna see Henry County get opted in. And so well, I gotta take it to the, to the uh, committee first. So I went and met with the building and zoning committee, which oversees the solid waste coordinator, who's also building and zoning coordinator. Uh, got their blessing on it. And then we went to the full county board and presented it and they approved it. Uh, as a company, Eagle, we fill out the opt-in form every year, uh, list all of our collection events with the curbside program, list our drop-off and submit it to the solid waste coordinator uh, for his approval to sign off and uh, finalize the opt-in. And the great thing for our county is total cost to them is nothing. They pay not a dime for this program. They're awful lucky. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, Stark County, uh, a little different kind of uh, ball game. Uh, Stark County is a very small county. I think they're the second smallest county geographically in the state of Illinois. Um, there, we don't have an operation, uh, a physical location within the county. Uh, so we couldn't run a, a permanent drop-off location there. But at that time, we had three curbside collection programs running uh, in three of the largest communities within the county. Uh, so we uh, contacted the uh, county board and they directed their state's attorney to come over and meet with me. We went through the program. I explained you know, what was going on with Sarah, how, it, how the whole program worked. We filled out the opt-in form. He took it to the county board and recommended that their acceptance, and uh, which they did. Now I go through, fill out the form, listing the collection events, send it to the county board president for a sign off. And again, this is another program that runs at no cost to the county. Next slide. 
Um, so under Sarah, there's you know a lot of great advantages to this program. We really like as a collector. It's really helped us out to be a better operation. Um, the guaranteed outlet for electronics is a big deal. Knowing that every year we are going to have a place to go with our electronics through the program makes a huge difference in our planning and you know what are we going to be able to do. Uh, I don't have to worry about being able to store stuff for a long time to get weight, uh, shopping around through different electronics uh, recyclers to find somebody who has a weight available. Uh, I just I call the recycler and say I've got a load and we move from there and get everything uh, shipped. Um, the nice thing, another nice thing is we're able to deviate from that baseline program so that either uh, you know one permanent side or the or the uh, like four collection events, we are able to deviate from that for what works for these counties. Um, you know, again, we're in small rural counties. Henry County is about 50,000 people in the entire county. Uh, so we're not a huge population base. Uh, so being able to go through and, and tailor some of these programs to make things work for, for these residents helps. Um, it's also nice, we don't have to go out and shop for supplies. Under uh, Sarah, the manufacturers through the recyclers are responsible for providing us with the pallets, Gaylords, uh, and shrink wrap to uh, stack and uh, package all the material. They provide the trucks, they send them down, and we don't pay for any of those prices. Um, and we've never had an issue getting the, those materials in. Um, I just call the recycler, say, I need this, and they send it down usually in uh, like a semi load quantity of material because I have the space to store that. Um, and it makes a, a big difference for us. And we, you know, we don't have to go hunt around and try to find our supplies. We're not paying for those supplies, uh, which will increase our cost. That's a, a big, uh, big help for us. Um, the last one um, is the ability to charge for TVs and monitors. We still see the majority of what comes through our facility is televisions and, and computer monitors. Whether they're uh, old CRTs, I still see some of those coming through, a lot of those really. Um, we're seeing a lot of flat panels coming through. Uh, being able to charge for those uh, is an essential piece to our program. Because we have no funding from our counties to support our program, that's the only way that this program works. If I don't have that kind of funding to support the, all of our labor to go through, you know, meet with customers on load stuff, get it stacked up and stored, and then load onto the semis, we would quit uh, because we can't operate at a loss for business. Um, so that, that's the basic that we would, you know, if there's no funding uh, on that side, we're out. Next slide, please. Uh, there are a few uh, issues or hiccups we've run into through the years. Um, just a few of them. Uh, because we do manage two different counties, um, when they get into a, uh, a different group plan or manufacturer program, it can get to be a kind of a confusing issue. It's not horrible because Stark County produces just barely one semi-load a year, so I just have one load usually at the, uh, in the fourth quarter that gets shipped for Stark County. Um, and in most of the years so far, we have been in the same program, often with the same recycler. I just let them know that I have a load ready to go and tell them which county it's for, which is mostly Henry County. Um, so that, that helps when I have to go through trying to manage uh, contacting somebody else besides the recycler through a different group plan uh, to try to coordinate getting supplies or uh, you know trucks arranged, it becomes more of a, a hassle on that side. Um, of course, we're having trucking delays. This is not anybody's fault or any, anything anybody can control within the programs. Um, it's just a universal issue in, in all industries right now. We all see the supply chain issues. Um, so our, the recycler we work with um, have had some issues getting outside trucks. So um, instead of being able to catch something that's local, they have gone through and sent down their own trucks from their facility uh, to pick up stuff. Uh, but they've always been really good. Usually uh, I, I contact them that I have a load and I will have a truck in my dock within a week. Um, and I, it's sometimes, you know, that's as much on me as them because I require dock appointments to load because it does take about two hours and I don't want to have any uh, detention fees on the truck. So I want to make sure I know when it's coming and then I can get everything out and staged, ready to load on the truck when they're here. So we don't delay that driver any more than uh, as absolutely necessary. Um, public education and awareness. Uh, we spend a lot of time explaining this program to people why there are, uh, you know, certain items are included in the program and certain ones aren't, you know, that there is a ban that these materials cannot go to the landfill. Um, and then trying to get people aware that these electronics, even though we can accept them and we are a private company that accepts them, they cannot go in their recycling cart on the curb. They can't go into a drop-off program uh, in their community that doesn't have curbside recycling. 
you know, we are constantly dragging electronics out of drop-offs and carts um, because and it, part of that is just because we are the, the recycling hauler and we're the uh, electronics collector. So this will it's all going to the same place. Well, yeah, but if it goes through our truck, it's also going to be crushed and that doesn't work. It doesn't work for recyclers. It doesn't work for, uh, for us. So trying to get people to uh, not put their electronics in their uh, other collection means for their standard recycling uh, becomes an issue. And we just have to tackle that with public education. Uh, so getting that word out. Um, and your municipalities, if you're doing curbside programs are a big deal to helping with that public education and knowing that program is out there. Uh, the community that has used it the most uh, for their for the curbside electronics program, their uh, folks in City Hall are uh, really good about letting uh, residents know when they go and pay a water bill. Hey, you know, if you got electronics or if they got asked about it, you know, call Eagle Enterprises and get on their schedule to come pick it up at your house uh, this month. So uh, the other thing is because we're in a rural area and there's a lot of counties around that are not opted in and have no options for collection, we get a lot of people coming in from other neighboring counties. Um, because the way we operate, because we're a private business and because we are charging uh, for the televisions and computer monitors, we're taking the material because these people have no other options. Uh, in particular, uh, Bureau County, uh, if somebody calls Bureau County or the city of Princeton and asks about electronics recycling, they're sending them our way. And that's a 45 mile one way trip out of Princeton to our facility. And we are the most convenient location to go for their residents because they have no other options in the county. Um, I've had people come from as far away as Boone County on the Wisconsin border, Logan County down around Lincoln. Uh, and I think over the over the years, as we track where the people are coming from, uh, it's about 17 or 18 different counties have come in to our facility with electronics um, in the last 16 years because we're available. So um, that access to collection and the time frame is a big deal. So um, we're, at, we're an advocate that if you can do a permanent site, uh, it works better because it's more convenient for people. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, some things we found as ways to improve success is have space to collect material before you start stacking it. So in our building, I've got an area that's designated off that's about 20 by 20 um, that we will unload and just set materials in there for a few days or a week until we have a stockpile of material. And then we can go through and select different size items that are are similar to other items and uh, make better stacks. So we go through almost all of our televisions um, for at least the CRTs are stacked up. They're not boxed. Um, with having that space and area to go through and, and set up and sort through that material and find uh, similar size materials, we can build better stacks that are more stable. Uh, so we can make sure we get up to our weights. Uh, like J uh, James talked about, you know, having that weight on the truck we never have had an issue coming anywhere close to uh, being underweight on a truck. Most of our trucks go out 22 to 24,000 pounds. Um, one of the other ones, uh, and again, this is not something we figured out. It was a, a trick we learned from a recycler about 10 years ago is get yourself some packing tape. If you're stacking this stuff, uh, packing tape works like strapping and you just go around three or four times right on top of itself makes a huge difference in stabilizing stacks. So you can get them wrapped with shrink, uh, shrink wrap. Um, we use it a lot. You can go through and if you've got, um, you know, something that wants to slide or move, the adhesive of the packing tape is a big assistance in making uh, these stacks more stable. Um, you know, trying to, you know, transport over highways. Um, you know, we know the ro what our roads are like, and we don't want these things falling apart uh, on the road. And when they you know, get to their final destination, open a door and have TVs falling out on somebody's head. Um, that's another reason why we always put boxes right on the back end of all semis. Uh, put a box there. There's nothing, for, you know, that box is not going to be falling out on somebody's head like a stack of TVs could. Um, and uh, find some competent stackers. Um, we've got north of 20 employees in our business, and I've got maybe five people that I will ever put on the job of stacking televisions and electronics because it takes somebody who's got the eye and the uh, desire to make really high quality stacks to make it work. Um, they've got to go through and find that similar size material, be able to get it put in place and stabilize it and get it taped up and shrink wrap. Um, so it, that could be a challenge and a hurdle of doing things. If you're working with a uh, 
a recycler, um, you know, see if they, if you're doing this on your own and have, have to handle this material yourself, have them come out and show you how to do this kind of stuff, uh, work with them like that. Um, and another one is learn to make really good base stacks. Uh, when you're, if you're loading uh, semis, you need to get, put two pallets uh, in a stack every time, you know, all the way back to the truck to make your weight. So learn to make good base stacks. Um, we still see a lot of the old wood case console TVs. They make really great bases. You put two wood case console TVs on a pallet, tape them up and shrink wrap them. Then you can set another pallet on top and might as well just have a, a big block of wood under it. Um, so it really helps to, with the stability of the trucks when you can do that kind of stuff. Um, console TVs, uh, like I said, are good. The rear projection TVs are gonna be the bane of your existence because they are, a lot of them are bigger than any pallets. So they don't fit well. They don't stack with the darn and they don't have any weight. Um, most of the time, if we do a, a pallet of rear projection TVs, if I get three televisions on one pallet, I'm doing good. Uh, usually that's gonna be uh, two floor models and a tabletop. And they're gonna be six feet tall and not the greatest thing. So you, they sit up to high and you just kind of have to deal with them. Luckily, we're not seeing nearly the number of those coming through that we used to. So, uh, I think that's about it. Next slide. Um, okay, otherwise ways to diversify to help uh, funding your program is considering expanding the business e-waste. Um, you know, businesses have material that needs to go to, work with your recycler uh, and see if you can secure an outlet to be able to ship electronics materials to them. Uh, and you're gonna pay to probably get them to take it, but um, you know, you charge the business to do that and that will um, you know, help to increase your overall funding for the program make sure you're covering all your costs when you do that kind of program if you if you're going to go that route um we see a lot of businesses that that's what they uh they do they because there's nowhere else to go they'd be driving four or five hours to find anywhere to go if they could find anybody um another one is if there's some things you can add into a program that you can utilize to help make a little bit of money uh so one of the ones that we deal with a lot is christmas lights number one um you go find if you have a, a scrap yard or a, a some dealer that will pay for Christmas lights um, and see you know, what, the, what kind of way they will take them. They'll take them in boxes or they want them in a, you know, some sort of big container. Uh, because we operate a MRF as well, uh, doing curbside collections, the Christmas lights are, are tangler and cause a lot of issues for us running through that uh, MRF. So it's nice to get those out of there and they bring some value to it. We get paid for them when we take them into uh, a good authorized scrap yard that we'll go through and get them recycled properly. So. Uh, you know, if you can find little ways like that uh, to help increase and provide some extra service, um, like for Susan, you know, if you can possibly add, you know, boxes for Christmas lights in your county uh, drop-offs, you know, have just a box up beside you, toss uh, the Christmas lights in there. If you got something, you'll take them, might help uh, cover costs to this whole program. So, uh, next slide. Okay, that's it. And uh, be glad to take any questions um, at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Now that was excellent. And I believe very insightful for folks who are trying to get involved in this. Uh, I am next up and I'm not gonna read all of this to you. You know, I'm uh, currently the IRF president. I'm also the chair of the Illinois Product Stewardship Council. And uh, I've been doing this for over 30 years. So there you go. <laughs> I work uh, for Will County and we bid uh, third-party professional recycling services for our electronics programs. We're home to about 38 communities. And the way that the formula works under CIRA for us is we are allowed four uh, permanent sites in the, in, in the county. Um, we used to have prior to CIRA 13 permanent sites. Uh, so given the way that the population is in Will County, as well as the roads and things like that. We, we didn't feel that we could go down to four permanent sites and we wanted to explore other options. And one of the options is to turn those, those uh, sites into one day collections. And so you can, you can turn one site into four one day collections. So what we do is we kind of do a hybrid of this and we have, uh, a permanent site at one of our public works buildings uh, at Lockport. The city of Lockport graciously agreed to do that. Um, and so they're open twice a week to the public taking back electronics. 
And then beyond that, we have uh, other locations that are only open for a couple of hours, either once or twice a month. Most of them are twice a month. And we actually um, contract for a local recycler to come and uh, service those sites. So they have to bring a small truck, not, not one of the big semis from the big recyclers that are assigned to us by the clearinghouse, but their own, their own truck. And for two hours, collect the electronics, sorting them um, and stacking them and taking them back to their facility. Now where their facility is, which is not a drop-off, a public drop-off um, under this agreement, they then have to then put those materials into the semi that is staged there. Uh, and um, we average usually about once a week service from that site. So we're, we're staging a semi um, at both of these sites, the city of Blockport's Public Works, as well as our local recyclers, which uh, is A-Team, and they have been doing a fantastic job. Prior to A-Team, we had uh, another company and they didn't do uh, a fantastic job. So, <laughs> so we understand how that works. Um, and we encourage all of you who are thinking about getting into this to um, definitely uh, do, a, do an excellent job. So one of the things you need to do is check IDs. We limit materials to two televisions per vehicle. Uh, under CIRA, you can go higher than that, but then it starts to look a little less residential, a little more commercial, and we just don't wanna, we don't wanna make it look that way. We wanna keep it residential. So unloading of the vehicles, a lot of people ask if there's somebody there to unload the vehicle for them. Prior to CIRA, these drop-off sites did not have staff uh, at them, and consequently, there was not always assistance for folks. This way, there's always assistance, which is wonderful, and people love it. And with COVID, of course, um, they don't have to get out of their vehicle. So they love that even more. Um, the, the way that the material gets packed can alter ever so slightly depending on who you're assigned by the clearinghouse. And so at the beginning of each year when that clearinghouse or that new recycler starts, they have a meeting with our recycler to let them know what, how they wanna see the material coming in. Um, there's obviously the palletizing, the shrink wrapping that Adam mentioned. Um, and, then, um, and then the other part of our contract is we have uh, our local recycler A team actually do the staffing at the city of Lockport site and not have the public works people do that. Because as Adam mentioned, there's a skill to knowing how to sort. There is a very big skill in how to stack. I mean, it is, um, it is live Tetris. <laughs> so, so yes, um, definitely we wanna make sure our trucks are not under the weight and we don't get fined. I will tell you that in our agreement, we split that fine should it ever occur uh, with our recycler so that there's a, both of us are responsible if something's going wrong. So um, the mobile collections, as I mentioned, we do an intergovernmental agreement with the governments that host these uh, most of them are from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. in the evening. Um, we're in Bolingbrook, Frankfurt, Piatone, New Lenox, Shanahan, Wilmington, and in Manhattan, which I neglected to list here, and I apologize, which is the fourth Thursday um, of the month. So uh, anyway, our averages do vary. Uh, some of these sites are quite busy and can get up to 10,000 pounds uh, in the two hours. And other sites are actually very low and we can have anywhere from um, 100 pounds on a winter night to, um, to 5,000 pounds for a lot of our rural, rural areas. Uh, when you're bidding a county contract, um, you should be aware that normally there is a bond requirement. In Will County, that's 10% of the projected value of the agreement. We do two-year bids uh, with a one-year renewal option. So our purchasing department would want a 10% value of 24 months um, in order for you to put that bid into us. You'd have to document your certifications. We want information on the history of your electronic recycling. Uh, how long have you been doing it? How much do you usually landfill? Um, and I'm always suspicious when somebody says zero because you're always getting nonsense that you didn't want. So <laughs> there's probably something that you had to landfill. Maybe it wasn't an electronic, it was just something that was supposed to be there. Uh, downstream information, obviously, um, uh, as, as has mentioned, 
by James and Adam, if you're going to take materials that are not included in the, in the banned list of items, you might not be sending those to the manufacturing clearinghouse recycler. You might have other arrangements with other recyclers or scrappers. And uh, we would like to know where all everything is going to go. And we do ask for you to take more items than are actually banned. Um, we would like you to be reliable, professional. Obviously, if we've told the public you're going to be there at 5 p.m., we need you set up before 5 p.m. so you can start taking items from them. Um, and then reporting to us, we, we ask for details such as how many cars were served uh, at, at the event that evening, as well as um, how much weight from each community was taken uh, so that we actually have really, really good records. Um, and then and then we also have in this a front door service arrangement, uh, which is where someone can call and for an additional price, because this is an additional service, uh, our recycler will go to their home and pick up those materials. And there is, there is a charge per TV, one TV. So um, we'll take additional items that are non-television sets with it, but um, each TV has a charge. And um, at this point, uh, we only arrange for it to be at your front door in front of your garage, where we're not covering anybody walking into your house. So you can't get it outside, then that's a whole nother issue. <laughs> but um, it has helped a lot with our seniors. It's helped a lot with folks who just don't have the vehicle for the large television sets. Um, so uh, pretty much, I think that that kind of covers um, what we're trying to do. Um, but we're, we're always open to other ideas. Just to give you um, a little intro for our next speaker here, uh, over the years, we've had several of our communities actually add this element of curbside service. It's called at your door if it's being done through waste management. Um, but we have um, at least three haulers servicing communities in Will County who are doing this for certain communities, not all of our communities by a long shot. But certainly, and none of that weight is actually captured in my county numbers because it's not getting processed through the Sierra program, to my knowledge. So um, I, I would um, look forward here to hearing from Pete Adrian, um, who has been talking trash since 1994 when he managed a student run recycling program at NIU. He has been with SWAFO since 2001, assisting various municipalities and organizations within Lake County to decrease the toxicity and the volume of waste disposed in our landfills through the implementation of aggressive recycling and waste diversion initiatives. He's responsible for managing the agency's electronics collection program uh, and monitoring residential and commercial waste and recycling service contracts, as well as implementing various food waste diversion and composting programs. Uh, including the coordination of their USDA Community Compost and Food Waste Reduction Grant. He assists in implementing various recycling education programs, holds a bachelor's degree in engineering from Northern Illinois University, and is a certified sustainable resource management professional through the Illinois Recycling Association and Kankakee Community College. He is a board member of the National Recycling Coalition and VP of ILCSMA. He resides in Gurney, Illinois, has three children, is a Boy Scout adult leader enjoying camping and hiking. Pete, did you, uh, did you want to use this opportunity to share your screen with us? We were yes. unable to get your slides prior to presentation. Right now, hopefully you can see that. There we okay. go. Okay, yep. so um, I'm gonna just focus on one particular thing and that's how uh, Swalco has worked with the private sector uh, waste hauling community in Lake County uh, to assist us in uh, the way our program operates. Um, I'm going to try to jump to the next slide here if I can. So uh, swalco has been around since 1989. Um, we were one of the first to adopt solid waste management plan in the state. Uh, I worked for 42 municipalities, so I've got a lot of bosses. Um, and uh, we also have the Naval Station Great Lakes, and uh, we represent about 97% of the counties, uh, roughly, uh, we're a little under a million population here in Lake County. So um, that's what we do. Uh, we implement reliable programs, assist our members, 
um, so I'll talk about today and uh, also try to do as much education as possible. So uh, one of the things that we've got going here is um, with our electronics program, we started in 2000. We were one of the first uh, doing electronics uh, from residential sources. Uh, we probably, you know, said we're the largest and longest running. Um, I don't know if anybody's uh, gotten more than what we've collected, but at, it's immaterial at this point. Um, but with the implementation of CIRA, the agency, uh, we were able to eliminate our one day collections and focus on uh, more regional permanent year round collections. So, you know, we started out back in 2000 doing one collection with Motorola. Um, at their old plant where they used to make the StarTech phones and uh, in Libertyville and uh, Motorola covered the cost and uh, that program. And then we realized it was getting quite big. Uh, we tried to satellite it out and do more one day collections. And at some point we, you know, got into the situation where we had, you know, thousand cars showing up for one day collection. And uh, just unbelievable to manage, you know, and predict what the turnout was going to be. We didn't have a, appointments. It was just first come, first serve. And, you know, when it rained, you got more people than when it was a nice day. And, you know, so many of you probably understand some of those uh, challenges when you, when you go out and mobilize uh, for a collection without uh, really knowing what you're up against, um, you know, other than a prediction. Um, so what we ended up doing was we started scaling back and trying to find uh, permanent year-round collection sites um, in basically utilizing our network of municipal um, uh, members. And some of our municipalities were uniquely uh, set up to be able to do that. Um, they had extensive, you know, large public works yards that would allow public for drop-off. They had staffing, they had the ability to either store or um, enough electronics to, to build a, a trailer load quantity. Um, we had a couple iterations of doing different things besides trailers. We were using roll off containers, uh, enclosed, uh, uh, you know, intermodal containers, a uh, myriad of different things were happening with the way the program evolved. But as we got into CIRA, we realized with the opt in, um, that, you know, we had a limit of how many locations we could have as permanent uh, collection sites. Um, so what we started to do was uh, look to integrate the program in with our waste haulers and, and uh, uh, operators. So we reached out to our hauler community. We have uh, now four waste haulers that operate in uh, the county um, that provide collection services to the residential sector. Um, we reached out to them and uh, started to build a, a bit of a coalition, if you want to call it, with them, but also uh, with our municipal members, we helped them with developing their waste hauling contracts and renewals and uh, integration of other things like organics collections or, in this case, electronics. And what we did was we, we uh, started building some boilerplate language into the contracts that asked, at least in the... Um, uh, bid process to quote the cost of uh, providing collection for electronics. Um, and uh, we were surprised to see back that uh, after talking to the haulers and providing them some feedback on how CIRA works and how they wouldn't have any costs on their side for the actual recycling and hauling uh, and, and uh, packaging materials, Gaylords and pallets, that that would all be colluded in with the CIRA uh, package, if you want to call it that, um, it was, uh, they were quite pleased with the idea that they could provide an additional service to their uh, residential customers and municipalities with little to no increase um, in the cost of the service. Um, so there was just, you know, incrementally when you're serving a community of a couple thousand households, um, you can sometimes kind of use the term cook the cost of that uh, aspect into the into the rate and uh, it, it becomes fairly fairly small um, so we started floating that in the contracts and uh, seeing how the bids were coming back with that inclusion um, and found that most of the haulers were willing to do it um, so what we ended up doing was um, uh, 
we had the uh, a combination here uh, as kind of a hybrid now, um, but we opt in uh, each year and included in that opt in is we list the um, four waste haulers that operate in Lake County that collect electronics as um, what I kind of call uh, consolidation points. Um, only one of the haulers actually has a public drop off, so they're listed as a public year round drop off, but the other three are um, not open to the public. Uh, instead, what's happening is uh, it's kind of a, a hybrid approach. Um, the hauler provides a service in a few different ways. Uh, they have public drop off at their facility. In this case, we have one hauler that does that. But also what they're doing is they're either providing a roll off service provided year round uh, in a uh, municipality's uh, select locations that are determined by the municipality and the, and the hauler. Um, or they're doing a route collection and that route collection can be on call or under maybe specified dates. I think Adam explained some of that earlier in his presentation on how he does that as well. Um, you know, we've seen haulers provide a first pickup day of each month. Um, you could just set out your electronics. Um, there could be some limitations on the quantities or the, the types of material. Um, or, like I said, the on-call method where a resident just calls up and then they're given a date and told when the next pickup will occur. It could be the next day, it could be the next month, but um, in many cases, it's, it's somewhere in between there. Um, so that works out pretty well. And then again, the hauler brings that material back to their uh, facility where they're, you know, you know, you know parking their trucks and uh, running their operations. Uh, and then the, what they're doing is they're consolidating and packaging the electronics at their facility using their labor. Um, so that's all kind of built in. And, uh, you know, the, the way they do that is in various ways, but um, in essence, uh, what they're gonna do is they're gonna haul, they're gonna bring that material back to their facility, load it on a, uh, a trailer that's provided through the Sierra Recycler. Um, now that trailer can be kept on location and swapped as needed. Um, generally, if they're generating a trailer load quantity per month, um, the uh, recycler we work with currently uh, is uh, willing to allow that trailer to sit there. Um, sometimes we're switching trailers out more frequently than that, um, but uh, usually a, a month minimum. Um, if they're not, uh, then we try to work towards a live load situation where the hauler uh, has an, builds up enough electronics in their facility and then um, the uh, uh, recycler dispatches a trailer out on a live load basis, as Adam described earlier. Um, you know, that can take some time sometimes at their facility, but um, usually that works out pretty well um, as, in addition to that. So those are kind of the models. Um, again, uh, this does help. Um, one thing that we've seen is with the with the clearinghouse and uh, the state, they've been willing to allow this this model to occur. Um, had been some questions initially on about well, is, is the waste hauler going to be you know bringing in some commercial material into this? And um, we've we've worked pretty closely with the haulers to make sure that they're not doing anything like that. Um, we also have another program that we. Uh, operate the it's outside of Sierra that's for businesses uh, that we run a, a monthly in most cases monthly uh, mobile event that travels around to different locations in the county where uh, businesses only are are encouraged to uh, bring their electronics in a little different model there are some charges for uh, CRTs and monitors through that program but in this program that we run in, in Lake County we do not have any charges um, now the waste haulers, if they are doing an on-call um, uh, type of collection, um, they are allowed, not all do, um, to charge for um, televisions or monitors if, uh, if, if they are collecting one of those. And, uh, you know, normally that's a nominal cost as most of you understand. And, uh, residents are generally used to extra pickup fees. Um, by waste hauler, so it, this is a convenience. It doesn't get it out of their house, as Marta alluded to. There's still some challenges with moving things out, um, but we do have a, a good network of junk haulers, you know, the 800 gap junks and the likes that will bring those things out of a house. Um, they typically, uh, you know, are bringing that 
material over to a goodwill as far as I understand, but um, you know, so it may get counted in the CIRA, it may not, we don't, don't know all the networks that these, these uh, junk haulers go through, but a little bit of bleeding out on some of that stuff, not, not too bad. But, um, and we do have quite a bit of the private sector, or I mean the, um, the, the you know, the, the, the commercial, you know, the good best buys, and like I said, the goodwills that are collecting in our uh, area, since we do have a pretty extensive, you know, population in our Northeast Illinois here that uh, those networks exist too. So um, that's nutshell how the program operates. I'm just going to kind of conclude with that. And certainly uh, willing to take questions. If you need to reach me, feel free to reach out. I can provide that, you know, I'll call it the boilerplate language that goes into contracts. But um, I think combined with like kind of how Adam's doing, what he's doing for the counties and what I'm doing up here in Lake County with the haulers, um, there's, there's, a, there's a good amount of tools available to kind of make this work. And um, I certainly, you know, think it's a, a value added uh, that the uh, waste haulers are providing in their contracts. Um, it's great for when they're doing renewals. Um, it's one extra thing they can add in and uh, doesn't usually have a lot of uh, uh, high overhead involved in it, but uh, I'll leave it at that. Could you stop sharing, Pete? I shall. And thank you. Let's see if it works. Let me figure out how to do that. There it is. All right. All righty. And then I'm going to try to share again. And I apologize for the. Let's see here. I can. Um, There we go. All right, I think we're back on track. Uh, and I wanna thank everyone, apologize for that. We don't usually um, have that kind of a break, but um, it worked out. And I hope that you guys uh, were able to learn how if you're a waste hauler um, or a curbside recycler and you would like to try to do something or are, or are doing something already, uh, and want to see if you can get the cost of that recycling of electronics off of your books and onto um, the clearinghouse, then this is uh, the way that Pete has been making that work up in Lake County. So that opportunity is there. Uh, uh, we have next events coming up. As I mentioned uh, at the beginning, we have an invitational for our Chicagoland region uh, government folks to meet with Glass about the restaurant and tavern glass recycling program that's been going on. We're gonna be doing uh, in the end of February, a program on plastics, which will uh, be featuring the artists behind the plastic store along with uh, what's going on with uh, the plastics and what, are, what, what can we be targeting better in our curbside programs or uh, drop-offs. And then in March, we will be trying to tackle the battery issues. So we do hope that you'll come back for that. And uh, remember it is membership time. So join the Illinois Recycling Foundation if you haven't renewed already. Be sure to do that today. Uh, and now our question and answers. We're going to be featuring all of our speakers today, which is uh, James Jennings, Jason Linnell, Susan Monty, Adam Jaquit, uh, myself, and Pete Adrian. Uh, and uh, we look forward to the questions uh, that uh, you have on how you can become more involved in electronic recycling. I know there was a question from, uh, do we have data from prior uh, 20, 2019, 2018? James, did you want to take that? Yeah, so uh, short answer is uh, yes. Well, um, I don't believe it's still on our website just because of the number of iterations that our site has gone through, um, but the information is available and we can share that. Um, after I get off, I'll see if I can track down some of the historic information. I'll send that to Marta and Gloria. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, and I'd just add on the data, um, it does show a, a lot more that was coming through, um, or at least being reported, but um, some of the reports when we were trying to come up with estimates for the clearinghouse, um, we saw there's there's uh, some double counting among the collectors reporting and then the manufacturers reporting. Um, so it's really hard to tell, sift through what was the actual number coming through, in addition to what Jean's pointed out about the credits and things like that. Um, so we still show uh, in 2019, the first year is around 29 million between 
the opt-in programs and the private programs. And then 2020 with the closures and things like that for a while, it went down to about 25 million um, in the, for the year uh, there. So that's also private programs plus the opt-in programs. Thanks, Jason. Excellent. And from uh, Lauren Williams of PCs for People, uh, he's saying it's great. You can see his message in the chat. It's great that we're saving so many electronics from ending up in the landfill. Is there any provision to siphon off or divert usable computers from the current recycling stream in order to provide them to the 1 million plus Illinois residents who lack access to a computer? If not, any or is there any interest in discussing that? And James, did you want to talk maybe a bit about CIRA as far as how it's structured? Because I, I don't know that it's structured specifically for reuse, but it allows for reuse. Yeah, so I mean, some of this I think is a, um, a bit of a function of state law. Maybe collectively both in CIRA and in the um, Illinois Environmental Protection Act, um, reuse and recycling are defined in an almost synonymous manner. Uh, and so, I mean, from the agency's perspective, I mean, our preference would be um, to encourage reuse before getting further down the path of uh, needing to deconstruct materials. Um, and CIRA would authorize that. Um, at this point in time, I mean, the program is largely um, set up in a way to trend toward recycling, but, um, Without question, I mean the uh, the um, collectors or other program participants would certainly be able to um, pull material and then um, divert it to other um, uh, existing users uh, prior to going into the recycling, and we'd be open to that. And, and Jason, did you want to talk about it maybe from the perspective of the recyclers? The clearinghouse uh, has, as far as what reuse they do, because I know some of the components are reused and, and the difference maybe if, uh, I, at least I've been told residential material can be quite old and um, right. more difficult. So did, did, you know, did you wanna take that? Sure, yeah, um, that is true on the household. The, the Illinois, the CIRA law is limited to household devices. So from the household perspective, you are going to get less reuse value there, less reuse potential from everything coming in since it's older. Um, it tends to be those, I've heard talk about the wooden consoles, not, not a lot of reuse going on with, with that stuff, but um, it can happen. I would just uh, talk to the recyclers who are working under the program uh, to see if there's a way to divert it. Um, obviously you need to have some uh, guardrails on there to make sure that it's uh, being diverted for legitimate uh, reuse purposes. It's going to programs that know how to handle and, and refurbish devices and, and not create waste from that point. Um, so yeah, as long as you can work out the details with the recycler or whoever's managing the program, uh, that, that can happen here. It just it wouldn't be counted in some of the totals that we're seeing under CIRA because that's for um, the ultimate recycling, the final disposition of the devices. So if I can just maybe interpret a little, if, if I'm somebody who wants to refurbish computers from a residential program, are you suggesting I contact the local collector uh, in, in a case you know, where there's a local recycler involved and then that won't be counted in Sierra or do I go to the recycler who is getting the semi truck delivered to their door and try to take some of their materials from them there? I mean, technically you could do both, but it would be more complicated going to the recycler because at that point it's um, you know been transported and uh, arrived at the recycling facility um, there. And the recyclers do have reuse programs more for their their business um, material stream that they're getting in. So uh, it, it's easier under the program to do it at, from the collection point rather than once it's been transported and gotten to the recycler. Okay. Um. Okay, and Paul Cooney, James is asking, should we be getting a 2021 reporting form soon from IEPA? Um, yeah, so after our forms are now set to uh, refresh when the calendar year rolls over. And so I've gone ahead and shared the link to the new form in the chat, but um, all of the forms for reports that are due during 2022 are currently available in our, on our website. 
Great. I think that's it, Marta. That's all that's all that's in the uh, chat. No, I appreciate that question, Paul, because I'm sure I'll be looking for it. So <laughs> Um, the, is there any more questions? And I'm going to take us back to a uh, full screen with one last, re well, I don't know if it was the last, but one reminder, March 1st is the deadline for counties to opt in. And so if you are not one of the counties on the call right now and you are an interested recycler, now's the time to start having a dialogue with those counties um, or with your municipality. If you're in a county that hasn't currently opted in, and you, you need to chat with Adam about how he was able to help his two counties opt in, because that is, that is something you can do and um, you can facilitate, but obviously it, it takes a little bit of effort. So um, definitely have that chat with Adam, but I'm gonna just stop the sharing and we can see everybody's faces. <laughs> and anybody that has questions, unmute and please feel free or raise your hand and we can call on you if we want to keep it as orderly as possible. Uh, just a note to everybody, uh, we will be uh, distributing this recording to everybody who registered uh, for the webinar and we will also have a copy of the chat to, to give to everybody. So that link that uh, James provided will be available. I'm going to ask um, Pete, when you were trying to estimate how much a community would do and you had a hauler say, I, I haul for X community, um, how did you figure that out? Because when you're filling the opt-in form out, you need to estimate how many uh, pounds are going to come from a given location. So what was the formula you used? Yeah, that's a great question. Now, you know, it's been so long. Um, and now I have real data from these when I re-opt in. Um, I want to say that we kind of looked at that per capita number that was originally thrown around when we were doing the planning for this. You know, what was it? Uh, four and a half pounds or something was kind of the national. I think we were saying it was going to be more like seven, but. Well, we um, said it was seven, but we never got anything more than four yeah, in the so, legislature. Uh, you know, in my communications with, uh, you know, James Staff and Jason, we had you know, kind of understood that these these numbers on a new site were not going to be 100% uh, accurate, and there was some expectation that you know it would it would eventually you know get looked at a little more closely if needed. But um, it really, I don't think that was the the you know kind of a, an issue, if I could say. I don't know, Jason, if you want to comment. I know there's a, a huge formula that's calculating in the background there for you as to how the each uh, recycler gets a uh, allotted weight based on the manufacturer's goals and things. So um, I don't know if there was some, you know, we kind of used past precedent, and divided it up a little bit from what I recall. Um, so it was, it was definitely an estimate. It was not an actual number. So, but now we, I just put in each year, the, the actuals from the previous year as, as my calculation. Yeah, I'd say um, having actual data is, is the best. Uh, if it's a brand new program, um, you know, it, best to be a little bit a little bit conservative. Even nowadays, uh, pounds nationally are coming down. Um, it's one of the uh, reasons uh, that uh, the way the Illinois program is structured it can handle that pretty easily. Uh, you don't have to worry about meeting a target or worry about um, whether or not you're successful if your pounds are coming down. Um, because we're seeing fewer of the CRTs, we're seeing more of the, the lighter weight devices coming in. And if you've got an established program that's been around, there's not really a rush for people to bring in all their electronics all at once. Um, I generally err on the side of looking at more like one to two pounds per capita for a new program. Um, that's, you know, been pretty good as a basis, depending on what you're do, doing, depending on how widespread you're having a collection, either events or a site that's uh, convenient and open at reasonable times for everybody. Um, so that's, that's one way to go, but for now, right now, since we have so many counties in the program, it's great to base it on historic data. We've got several years worth of trends and we can see still that pounds are coming, slowly coming down.
Thank you. Any other any other questions? Well, you certainly have everybody's contact information, and uh, I'm happy to give everybody a few minutes back their time today. Uh, and we'll have this up on our, our website or our YouTube channel soon. Gloria will get that done. But I want to thank all of our speakers for sharing their knowledge and expertise and their time with us today and all of you in attendance. And I hope that all of you are able to, uh, to do a little bit more on electronic recycling in the future. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.